Explorer X here, grab yourself a coffee, sit back and relax. We're going all over the world with folklore cryptids and some hard to believe stories. Do you believe in the Ozark Howler? The Ozark Howler is a mysterious creature living deep in the woods of the Ozarks. Its territory extends from southern Missouri to northern Arkansas, and sightings have even been recorded in Oklahoma and Texas. Of course it's just a local legend. Or is it? What is the Ozark Howler? The Ozark Howler, or the Ozark Black Howler, legend has been passed down for generations by locals who have heard things they could not describe and have seen things that couldn't be described as an animal that you would expect to find in the heart of the Ozark wilderness. Its frightening sound and eerie appearance has been seen in the more remote parts of the Missourian and Arkansan Ozarks, and even farther west in Oklahoma and south in Texas. It is typically described as being around the size of a bear, with a thick body, stocky legs, black shaggy hair, and having prominent horns. Most agree that it is either black or dark in color. Its cry is often described as being a combination of a wolf's howl and an elk's bugle. Skeptics claim that it's an eastern cougar, a black bear, or some kind of wolf or feral hound. Sightings have been officially recorded since the 1950s, though many Ozark families can pass on stories of their parents and grandparents experiencing the chill of seeing the Ozark howler well before that time. Between 2005 and 2010, the howler was spotted several times. A family living north of Van Buren in the Boston mountains of Crawford County set out trail cams after spotting what they believed was a cougar. The images they supplied to a Fort Smith television station appeared to show a big cat similar to a cougar. The problem is that wildlife officials maintain there is not a breeding population of cougars left in Arkansas. They do concede that it is possible there might be individual big cats living in the mountains pointing out they likely were once held as pets but escaped or were turned loose by their owners. The howl the howl, as you might expect, is the hallmark of the Ozark Howler. Its sound has been described as very deep and guttural, as well as a high-pitched howl. Others have said that it's the most unearthly scream and half-human. One of the most common descriptions of the sound is like the screams of a woman. Those who have heard the screams pierce the night never forget the chill that ran up their spine and the feeling of dread that washed over them. Some claim that the sounds are made by animals commonly found in the region. They point to the screams and howls of animals like the red fox, fisher cat, and even fighting raccoons. Is it a C.U. Sith? Scottish, Irish, Welsh and English settlers homesteaded the Ozarks Plateau in the mid to late 1800s and they brought with them their ancestral stories and mythologies. One such story was of the C.U. Sith, a mythological hound that is feared as a harbinger of death. The settlers believed the hound would come to bear away the soul of a person to the afterlife, similar to the Grim Reaper. The hounds of death went by other names, such as Bean Sidhi, Ku Sidhi, and C.W.N.N. According to Scottish folklore, the C.U. Sith is said to be the size of a young bull with the appearance of a wolf. Its fur is shaggy, and usually cited as being dark green though sometimes white. Its tail is described as being long, and either coiled up or plated. Its paws are described as being the width of a man's hand. The C.U. Sith is thought to make its home in the clefts of rocks in the highlands, and also to roam the moors and highlands. According to legend, the creature was capable of hunting silently but would occasionally let out three terrifying bays, and only three, that could be heard for miles by those listening for it, even far out at sea. Those who hear the bang of the sea use must reach safety by the third bark, or be overcome with terror to the point of death. It was also said the bang was a warning to lock up nursing women lest the beast abduct them and take them to a fairy mound, Scottish Gaelic, Scythian, P.L. Scythianin, to supply milk for the children of the fae. In Wales, they were associated with migrating geese, supposedly because their honking in the night is reminiscent of barking dogs. Hunting grounds for the CWN and are said to include the mountain of Cad Eridris, where it is believed. The howling of these huge dogs foretold death to anyone who heard them. According to Welsh folklore, their growling is loudest when they are at a distance, and as they draw nearer, it grows softer and softer. Their coming is generally seen as a death portent. 
Some people see a connection between the mythologies that came here with the settlers and the ancient stories of the Native Americans who inhabited the region. Natives told stories of saber-toothed tigers that used to roam the land, though they have been gone for thousands of years. Combining the stories of the tigers and the settlers' tales of otherworldly creatures that scream and carry off the souls of the dead may have resulted in the Ozark Holler. At about 7.15 p.m. on September 12, 1952, at Flatwoods, a little village in the hills of West Virginia, some youngsters were playing football on the school playground. Suddenly they saw a fiery UFO streak across the sky and, apparently, land on a hilltop of the nearby Bailey Fisher Farm. The youths ran to the home of Mrs. Kathleen May, who provided a flashlight and accompanied them up the hill. In addition to Mrs. May, a local beautician, the group included her two sons, Eddie 13, and Freddie 14, Neil Numley 14, Jean Lemon 17, and Tommy Heyer and Ronnie Shaver, both 10, along with Lemon's dog. There are myriad, often contradictory versions of what happened next, but UFO writer Gray Barker was soon on the scene and wrote an account for Fate magazine based on tape-recorded interviews. He found that the least emotional account was provided by Neil Numley, one of two youths who were in the lead as the group hastened to the crest of the hill. Some distance ahead was a pulsing red light. Then, suddenly, Jean Lemon saw a pair of shining, animal-like eyes, and aimed the flashlight in their direction. The light revealed a towering, man-like, figure with a round, red face, surrounded by a pointed, hood-like shape. The body was dark and seemingly colorless, but some would later say it was green, and Mrs. May reported drape-like folds. The monster was observed only momentarily, as suddenly it emitted a hissing sound and glided toward the group. Lennon responded by screaming and dropping his flashlight, whereupon everyone fled. The group had noticed a pungent mist at the scene and afterwards some were nauseated. A few locals, then later the sheriff and a deputy, searched the site but saw, heard and smelled nothing. The following day, Lee Stewart Jr. from the Braxton Democrat discovered skid marks in the roadside field along with an odd gummy deposit traces attributed to the landed saucer. It was almost fully dark on the evening of September 12, 1952. Edward May, Freddie May, Neil Nunley, and Tommy Heyer, all young residents of the town of Flatwoods, were playing on the lawn of the Flatwoods Elementary School. Suddenly, a bright light streaked across the sky overhead and appeared to crash into a hillside on G. Bailey Fisher's farm. The boys ran to see what it was they saw in the sky. The May's home was on their way so they stopped to tell their mother, Kathleen May, what they had seen. Kathleen called on National Guardsman Eugene Lemon and the family dog, Richie, to accompany her and the boys to the crash site. Upon reaching the site of the crash, the group saw a pulsing red light. Lemon shined his flashlight up the hill, and the group witnessed a terrifying sight, a ten-foot-tall creature, with a head shaped like a spade and what appeared to be a dark, metal, dress. The creature's hands were twisted and clawed and what seemed to be its eyes glowed in eerie orange color. It appeared to levitate off the ground. A strange, sickening mist hung in the air. The creature hissed and glided quickly toward the witnesses. The group then turned and fled in terror. Some of the members of the group suffered from throat irritation, vomiting, and nausea, which persisted for days. These symptoms were passed off as side effects of hysteria. But it is worth noting that these are also telltale signs of exposure to mustard gas. See the famous faces, artists, and writers who have visited the museum in the Hall of Fame. May and Lemon reported the incident to local authorities, who searched the area that night and claimed to find nothing. Many people may know about a werewolf but not a Rougarou, Perrin says. Folklore surrounding the Rougarou is as diverse as the word spelling. The term Rougarou originated from the word Lugaru, Lou being French for wolf and Garou, derived from an old Frankish form, Werewolf. Although the legends of the Rougarou are closely related to European werewolf tales, there are several distinctions between the European werewolf, the French Lugaru, and the night lurking, bayou wandering creature called the Rougarou. Perrin explains how in South Louisiana, everything has its peculiarities because it is rooted in oral tradition. The most common motif is of a nighttime exposure to the Rougarou. 
Perrin says. The person who encounters the Ruguru draws one or three drops of blood, that person then has the spell, and from there, the tale can be either light or dark. In the darker tale, usually the person who encounters the Ruguru commits suicide. The darker tale is almost always associated with a person who told of the encounter in less than a year. Because wolves are uncommon in the region, local stories of the Ruguru typically replace wolves with other animals' dogs, pigs, cows and chickens which are usually white. According to local stories printed in several sources found in Ellender Memorial Library archives, these animals roam the streets at night, antagonizing wandering people until they attack the creature, usually stabbing or shooting it. At the first drop of blood the animal will return to its human form, at which point he will tell the attacker who he is. Often the Ruguru is someone the witness knows or has heard of, and the Ruguru usually tells the witness if he informs others of this encounter within one year and a day, he too will become a Ruguru. One account of a lady from Lockport, taken from Werewolves on Bayou Lafouche, written by Jean Sarzen, Laura Krauss and Donald Krinsman, tells of a somewhat personal experience with the Ruguru. There were ten children in the family and all of them were up crying that night. I didn't get up for some reason, but a year or so later one of the brothers killed himself. This boy was always vying or hanging around with the other boys at night. One night he was walking home when he noticed a little white dog following him, snapping at his heels. He took out his pocket knife and cut the dog on its right foot. A Lugaru is a man who sells his soul to the devil and assumes the body of an animal. He can't be released until he is cut. The boy wasn't supposed to tell what had happened for a year and a day after he had seen the white dog turn into a man. But after it happened, he ran home and told his family. The next day a prominent physician appeared in town with his right arm cut and in a sling. I remember when the physician shot himself here in Lockport. A year later the boy killed himself and left a letter that the family turned over to the sheriff. Even today he refuses to let anyone see it. There are various methods used to keep the Ruger away. Some accounts tell of men who carry a certain leaf rolled up in their wallets to ward it off or of old women who paint some sort of hexagon shape on the middle of the floor and say certain prayers to keep the Ruger away. Today, the role of the Ruguru may be shifting, but it is still certainly present in the Cajun culture. The Ruguru has evolved into a threat to bad children. Parents says. Parents tell their children if they're not good then the Ruguru is gonna get them. The Ruguru plays a similar role to the boogeyman in other cultures. The term Ruguru has even become so popular in South Louisiana that it has evolved into a descriptive adjective. Ruguring used to describe a person who runs around or stays up late at night. Perrin says it is easy to find people who have a story about the Ruguru but is very difficult to find people who actually believe in the Ruguru. People of Louisiana want to hold on to the story, but people with an education don't want others to think they are crazy. She says, Although the role of the Ruguru may be shifting, it continues the traditional folklore of Cajun culture. The Ruguru plays as significant a role in continuing the Cajun culture as crawfish boils do. Perrin says, I was only 14 at the time of the railroad demon encounter. Now at age 30, I'm finally telling the story of that horrific day that changed everything. Me and my two best friends since kindergarten, Derek and Shooter loved everything supernatural. If there was a haunted house within a hundred mile radius we'd be there, armed with flashlights, cameras, and junk food to keep us going through the night. Time and time again we'd debunk a myth, urban legend, or find out that the creepy figure lurking about in the middle of the night was just old Mrs. Jenkins, stoned out of her mind on painkillers and gin. Looking back now, I can't imagine her son taking care of her every minute of the day and night. That man never had a life other than his mother's care. Running outside at night with his bathrobe on convincing her he wasn't a leprechaun. It was on one of those crazy nights that I got an anonymous phone call. I was up in my bedroom going through my ghost and ghouls comic books when my mom calls out for me. Jimmy! Yeah, ma? Phone! Who is it? Dunno, just come and get it. I rolled my eyes at the thought of it being Fat Ed the school bully. Once in a while, he'd make phone calls to kids' houses and when they'd answer, he'd either belch or fart in the receiver then hang out. 
I felt sad for anyone having to use his phone. Once in a while, someone would have the guts to write some interesting choice of words on his school locker but that seemed to give him more reason to cause harm. I lazily sauntered down the stairs and saw the phone was on the landing and picked it up. Hello? I said in a bored tone. No one on the line. Hello? Then a quiet hiss was heard. Almost like steam escaping pipes. Anger suddenly flashed before me. Maybe it was the interruption from my comic books or the fact that I was a pimply-faced 14-year-old boy that had no girlfriend and probably never would but either way, I wasn't going to waste one more minute on this joker. As I was about to hang up I heard it. My name. It was barely audible but it was there. Who is this? Newland. Came the response. Everything in my being told me to hang up but I couldn't help but listen. The tracks are where you need to be Jimmy. Come to the tracks at the cross anytime, I'll be waiting for you. Then the line went dead. I just stood there frozen and confused. Tracks? What tracks? Then it came to me. The railroad tracks on the outskirts of town, the crossing. Could that be it? My thoughts were interrupted by my mother ordering me to set the table and call my father for supper. Roast beef, boiled vegetables and mashed potatoes with gravy were on the menu which told me that I'd be getting roast beef sandwiches for lunch for the next two weeks. I accidentally sighed out loud as I was playing around with my food, the thought of the phone call running through my mind. What's wrong with you? My father looked at me with slight irritation. Nothing. I answered and that was a good enough answer for him as he went back to sawing through an extra dry piece of meat. My poor mother could take a delicious piece of meat and with a smile on her face, and all good intentions in her heart, murder the hell out of it. My father loved her beyond anything, even including me I felt sometimes, so he never mentioned her cooking unless it was to lie and say something nice. I know something's wrong James. Mom picked up where dad left off. That was the only problem, she was perceptive to every emotion no matter how much you tried to hide it. She stared with sweet patience and concern for my response. I, uh, I had a fight with one of my friends today. I don't want to talk about it. Hoping that would be enough to keep her at bay. She nodded slowly and said, Okay, eat your food. But I could clearly see that she believed none of it. That was mom code for, now I'm going to snoop in your room, check your backpack and pockets, and pretty much stalk you because you are lying to me. I sighed again but this time in my head. Two after supper, I ran upstairs to my bedroom taking the cordless phone with me. I had to tell Derek and Shooter about the call. I sat jumped on my bed and dialed. A few rings in. Hello? Hey Derek, it's me. I got something to tell you. I? Ugh, not now Jimmy. He sounded annoyed and angry. I just got grounded for a week for putting my sister's Barbie doll in the microwave. He hung up abruptly and I didn't dare call him back. You see, in Derek's house it was never a simple you melted your dear sister's doll on a platter so therefore you're grounded and can't watch TV. Everyone knows he was being beaten. Even though he'd try and hide the bruises, they eventually showed. No one talked about it to him because he never wanted to talk about it. He just pretended like nothing happened, got over his mood, and went on with life. The worse the abuse, the more he'd do dangerous things like jumping off of bridges into waters of unknown depths or shooting metal signs with his BB gun which was the cause of a small scar on his left cheek. We worried for him at times but when you're 14 and you can barely survive yourself, what do you do? Call your next best friend so I rang Shooter. Yeah. He answered in his signature way. Shooter! I got something crazy to tell you! What is it Booger? It always irritated me that he called me Booger but I didn't have time to argue with him. I got the strangest call from no one. What? Are you high right now? What are you talking about? I paused a moment before I spewed everything. Shooter listened without interrupting once which was shocking as that's how he got his nickname, by always shooting off his mouth. I finished my story and waited. Wow Booger, that's pretty creepy. So what do you say? The anticipation was killing me. Sign me up. I say we catch this phony and chalk another one as debunked. I could hear the excitement in his voice. 
Sometimes he was more enthusiastic about this stuff than me. Did you tell Derek yet? Yeah, well, he's grounded and stuff. We both fell silent and changed the subject. Comic books and horror movies were on the list of debates, and I spent the rest of the night too restless to sleep. We would have to wait for Derek to be ungrounded and then we'd check out the tracks. I made a list in my head of all the things we'd need and started on the lie I'd tell my parents to escape another Saturday afternoon of board games and lemonade. 3. The week passed slowly as molasses even though I made sure to keep myself occupied with a variety of interesting activities. Nonetheless, Saturday arrived, my lie was believed and before I knew it, I was on my way to the secret meeting place to meet Derek and Shooter in the woods, aka Shooter's backyard his father had been promising to mow the lawn since 1972 and now it had become a jungle. I got to a small clearing where three plastic chairs circled a small barbecue pit. That pit brought back some pretty good memories. Roasting hot dogs and marshmallows while we swapped comics and talked about everything under the sun. I was the first to arrive and took pride in choosing the better of the three chairs. Leaving the one with the slightly wobbly leg and the other with the broken armrest. My watch showed 2.45 p.m., the exact meeting time. I understood why Derek would be late since he lived farther away and had to ride his bike to make it to the meetings but what was Shooter's excuse? He lived half a mile away. His family had owned acres and acres of land around their house, all of it was unkept. Two paths lead to the clearing, one that I took that connected me from the back road, and the other if followed, would bring you right to the back door of Shooter's house. I waited bored and hungry so I opened my backpack and dug in to see what surprise I would pull out. A bag of ketchup chips surfaced, and I opened the bag just in time to see Derek zoom in full speed on his bike. He slammed on the brakes two feet away from me, throwing dust and dirt on me. Asshole! I yelled as he gave me a huge grin and untied his backpack from the back of his bike, swinging it over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. A faint yellowish-blue coloring could be seen under his right eye. I looked away from it. You are such a West Jimmy. Can't handle your tidy witties getting dirty. He punched my shoulder hard and took the seat to my left. Yeah, something like that. You want some dirt-covered chips? I offered and he kicked the bag out of my hands making them scatter everywhere. Where the hell is Shooter? He goddamn lives here. Hey Shooter! You dummy! Your breath stinks like crap and you're a lazy pig. The words echoed through the trees and fell only on the sound of a light breeze and few chirping birds. Hey Jimbo, can you go find Dummy before I light his house on fire? You do. I got here first and besides, the moment I get up to go, you'll steal my chair. The twinkling in Derek's eyes gave his little plot away and just then Shooter entered the clearing carrying a heavy looking cooler. Hey guys! I've got something special in here," he said in a tone so happy that his voice went an octave higher. What is it? Your brains? Derek shot back with a devilish smile. Shut up doofus or you'll be banned from having what's in here. We both leaned forward in our chairs as he sat the cooler down before us. He opened the lid with a triumphant tada, and we peeked in. Derek put his hand in. A serious look on his face as he slowly brought out an item clutched in his hand. Oh my god, Shooter. I can't believe you got, you got, Uncle Jack Root Beer. We both burst out laughing at the stupidity of the situation. Shooter got unusually angry and began rummaging through the dozen or so sodas. You bunch of idiots. How could I get these out of the house if they weren't buried under the sodas? He said, his anger vanishing quickly as he found his prize. He then pulled out three cans of beer. Whoa! Was my response while Derek snatched one out of Shooter's hands and before he could protest, it was opened and being tasted. We all stared at him in shock. What? He looked back and paused from his drinking. You can't possibly tell me guys this is your guys' first time drinking alcohol, right? Our dim-witted look said it all as he stretched back and chugged some more. Shooter tossed me mine and we both took baby sips. It was disgusting. It tastes like sweaty socks. I said grimacing. Shooter shared my sentiment but after a few more four sips, a wave of calm and relaxation came over us and we mellowed out like Derek, in silence. 
with just the swishing of cheap beer between us. The buzz was great, so great that we forgot about the tracks, the snacks, and even the time. Oh crap! What time is it? Shooter jumped up, killing the last little bit of buzz that was left. I checked my watch. 3.30 p.m. Oh thank God. We should go over our plan one more time and meet this joker. Make a fool out of him like he did you Jimmy. Derek nodded subtly and I was all for it. We threw our empty cans far into the woods and got to work, huddled together like footballers before a big game. For it was a long walk and many bags of chips and chocolate bars lost their lives in the process. In the distance, we could see the red and white painted X of the crossing. Our playful and joking demeanor eroded more and more the closer we got to it. An uneasiness began to settle on us which had never happened before. It was usually the same old nerd trying to be cool or taking revenge on anyone they could. We would call their bluff and they'd run away or start crying but this was different. It almost felt like there was an evil presence. Even Shooter became quiet. Do you see anyone? Derek whispered and if I wasn't mistaken, I thought I heard a twinge of fear in his voice. We scanned the area as we walked along the railroad tracks but could see no one. Bet you they were just yanking your chain, Shooter said as he thrust his hands hard into his hoodie pockets. I was about to agree with him until about 20 feet from the crossing sign, from behind the post appeared a figure. We stopped, stunned just at the fact that something the size of an average human man stepped out from behind a post six inches in diameter. It's funny how when you see the most unexplainable thing in the world, your brain just makes you accept what you just saw and says keep calm and carry on. Survival mechanism to prevent you from going insane I suppose. The thing shuffled a little closer to us and stopped. We were frozen with fear and shock. It was clothed in a multitude of worn and shredded garments of all sorts which made it look kind of bulky and misshapen with no arms. Its head hung low at a 90 degree angle so that its face was facing the ground and shoulder length dirty white hair hung in greasy strings as to hide any features. Shooter's eyes were bulging out of his head and he wasn't blinking and as for Derek, his mouth was partially open, his skin seemingly more pale than usual. Do you guys know what that thing is wearing? Shooter said slowly, eyes still wide. Me and Derek gave silence as our answer so he continued. Do you remember those missing kids pictures on the telephone poles and stuff? I think, I think I recognize the cloth eye. His words trailed off as the pieces of the puzzle fell frighteningly into place. The thing then raised its head and finally revealed itself. Where skin would be, it was flayed. Fresh blood oozed from everywhere, even out of the eye sockets where the eyes should have been. No lips but a gaping mouth filled with needle-like teeth made a chomping motion. Derek was the first to bolt down the line, followed by Shooter who screamed so loud as he raced past me that my ears started to ring. I was the last to get my jelly legs to work. The thing began to give chase. The train station was a mile away and we'd have to run full speed without slowing in the lust to have a chance at escaping it. That's the great thing about adrenaline, it can make you do the impossible. We didn't have to look back to sense how close it was. I managed to somewhat catch up with Derek and Shooter who were now running side by side. Then Derek turned his head and the look of terror on his red sweaty face said it all. I followed suit like a moron and looked behind me not only to see the monster about 10 feet away from me but also to catch my foot on a loose bit of rail wood and fall face first onto the metal, wood, and gravel. The pain was immense in so many places but the fear of being eaten alive overruled that pain as I rolled to a stop. It was seconds before it caught up to me and with no other thought process than to protect myself, I curled up into a ball my arms covering my head just to see it from my partially closed eyes, jump over me with ease and continue the chase. Luckily nothing was broken and I was able to get up and hobble run behind it, not wanting to abandon my best friends. I still to this day have no clue why it didn't attack me but I will never forget what happened next. Five with a busted lip and countless scrapes and bruises, I watched as the creature suddenly picked up speed and closed in on them. I yelled for them to run faster. I yelled at it to stop and take me. I begged God for help but nothing worked. It took Derek out first, knocking him to the ground with a powerful leaping kick that rendered him unconscious. Then it lunged at Shooter, 
Needle mouth opened wide as it sunk its teeth deep into his left shoulder causing him to yelp in pain. It looked exactly like when a lion would bring down a gazelle and the gazelle would just instinctively keep running while being slowed down by the sharp claws and heavy muscle of the beast. Shooter finally gave in and turned to face the evil that was attached to him. I, at this point, had managed to get close enough to the horror to see the blazing uncontrolled madness in Shooter's eyes. Like a flash, he began walloping the thing's face with his bare fist until I could hear the cracking of bone and the wet sound of blood. He was heaving and shaking and pale but the creature kept its mouthful. Then with a sickening display, it ripped a huge chunk of flesh from his shoulder, letting the meat slide down its throat. My senses somewhat returned to me and I began picking up rocks of all sorts and throwing them at it. I hit its head, back, and legs but nothing affected it. It simply ignored me and went about its business tearing my friend apart as he lay dying in a pool of blood. Shooter's nose was torn off, his scalp peeled away from his skull all while he was still alive and conscious. He no longer had the strength to utter even the slightest sound but lay there staring up at the summer sky as bits and pieces of body parts were stripped away and devoured. As a last attempt of courage and bravery, I tried to pull it away from its meal but with an effortless twist of its back and a backward kick, I was sent sailing through the air, landed badly, and broke my leg and arm which rendered me useless. At that moment, Shooter exhaled loudly and that was the last breath he took. And oh, oh, you bastard. I bellowed and cried until my voice was hoarse, all the while it pretended like I didn't exist. It zeroed in on the next victim who was now coming to. Derek, run! A crackly hushed voice emerged. It walked toward him while crouching, making its ugly head bob up and down as it went. Before Derek could react, it had latched onto his foot. With the other free one, he kicked and squirmed to get loose but like with Shooter, it was never letting go. I should have looked away, I should have closed my eyes but like with any trauma, it forces you to watch against your will. Now it was Derek's turn to pummel the thing senseless with all his might until exhaustion overtook him and he sat slouched and panting. I expected the foot to be ripped off and eaten but it had something else in mind as it slowly began to chew and swallow first the top part of the foot then made its way higher and higher. It sounded like the crispy ends of chicken wings being eaten but louder and coupled with blood-curdling screams. Tears poured down my cheeks as the feast ended at Derek's knee and the shock and blood loss turned his piercing screams to pitiful moans. Derek was amazingly still in a sitting position his jeans soaked in blood and bits of meat and bone. He was moving his arms slowly back and forth like a bird flapping its wings in slow motion, a look of death on his face. He was muttering something that I couldn't hear but whatever it was, the thing responded to the words by staring up at him, grinned, and took his whole face into its mouth. Derek's body was thrown violently onto its back and then started to convulse. By the time it disengaged from his face, his skin was gone and so were his eyes and for the first time, it noticed me. That's when I lost consciousness. 6. So, that's how you remember it exactly? The gray-haired shrink with the piece of spinach stuck between his teeth asked. Yes. I stared at the table we were seated at embarrassment at the thought of what I just told him. Who would ever believe me? Sweetie, are you sure that's what happened? My mother, who had always attended my shrink meetings, asked also. Yeah, ma. She leaned back in her chair and began to cry. I didn't mean to upset you, ma. It's okay. You don't have to believe me. I know you love me. You do, don't you, ma? She sniffled and nodded. I felt a small wave of relief and turned towards old spinach teeth. So, are we done for today? Yes, James, we're done for today. He seemed disheartened but I couldn't care less because today was board game and lemonade day with mom and even though I really did hate it I regretted not spending that time with her as a kid. Is dad coming to play this time? I asked her, hopeful. No, sweetie, he can't make it. Maybe next time she said through blowing her nose and wiping her tears. As she brought out the board game and thermos of lemonade from a duffel bag, the shrink, who was stuffing papers back into his briefcase, asked to speak with her in private. Something about him gave me the creeps. Like he was some sort of predator preying on my mom. If he ever hurt her, 
I'd make sure he'd regret it for the rest of his life. I gave him a death glare as they exited the room. You know Mrs. Erickson, it's been 16 years now and I think it's time to close this case. Her eyes grew dark with anger. I am not giving up on him, he's my son and I will get him help. I will get him fixed. The shrink pinched the soft bit of flesh between his eyebrows and sighed softly. If he doesn't admit to slaughtering his friends and dumping their bodies on the railroad. She didn't want to hear any more so turned and went back into the room with her son. Hey ma! Thought you left forever. I joked but she didn't seem in the joking mood so I dropped it. She carefully set up the game and poured the lemonade, put a straw in there, and gave me a weak smile. Do you think they could loosen the straps on this jacket? My arms are getting a bit numb? I asked, looking at my arms that were pinned across my chest, the sleeves of the jacket tied in the back. They sure know how to treat guests here. Why are they doing this to me, Ma? I'm the victim, my friends were murdered by some monster thing and I'm looked at like I'm crazy. Why can't we just go home? Desperation filled my voice and tears welled up. I'll play your side and you can tell me what cards you want and... Ma, I don't really care about the game. I want to get out of here. Help me. She banged her fists against the table which made one of the guards outside peek through the little round window. James, you need to tell me the truth about what happened that day. That's the only thing that will help you and get you out of here. I had never seen her this furious before so I stayed quiet. You've been saying the same exact story every month for the past 16 years. Not one word different, not one sentence out of place. Here's the reality of it all James and I don't care what psychological effect it may have on you because in all these years, they prevented me from telling you the truth. They wanted you to admit what you did on your own so they could study your reaction to your own words and help you from there but it's been too long and I'm too tired and I want my boy back so here it is. You never got an anonymous call from anyone. I heard you up in your room talking to yourself about going to the crossing and you were making strange hissing noises. I thought you were just playing around but I started to worry when I found drawings in your drawer of hideous creatures and dead bodies. When I confronted you about them, you said they belonged to Shooter and Derek. I knew you were lying. I just looked at her unblinking, shocked at what she was saying. You tortured, mutilated, and murdered your own best friends James, do you hear me? Her words assaulted my ears, I didn't want to hear this, was she telling the truth? Maybe she was mistaken, or maybe all this. My mind was ready to explode as she went on about the gory details. I rocked back and forth on my chair trying to calm myself. This is not true, this is not true. I muttered but then the thought of what if, what if she really was right, that I did murder my own friends in cold blood. The prospect of that shot pins and needles throughout my body. Why would I do such a thing? It made no sense. Then I noticed something behind her, peeking over her shoulder. My change of expression made her stop talking and look over her shoulder. The hollow-eyed demon was right there an inch from my mother. Ma! Watch out, it's right there behind you! I began to panic and struggled to free myself so I could save her. Two guards and a nurse suddenly came in, and I then felt a small burning pain in my hip. I looked down to see a needle stuck in me. No matter what I said and how much I thrashed about it was useless, and soon the drugs had taken effect and I slowly drifted off into another realm. Safe and sound from the railroad demon. The year is 1916. A little girl, six or seven, wanders into Sleepy Hollow Cemetery at night on a Halloween dare. She creeps among tombstones and mausoleums until she is stopped by an unsettling sound. It is a woman crying, softly, bitterly. Frightened yet determined, the girl makes her way toward the sound and arrives at the statue of a seated woman, twice life-size. The weeping has stopped but when the girl climbs into the statue's lap and reaches up to touch the face, there are tears under the eyes. The little girl was the grandmother of Emily Storms Arminio, a tenth-generation native of Sleepy Hollow, who recalls hearing the tale often. Over the years, Succeeding generations of Sleepy Hollow residents, the people who Washington Irving described as subject to trances and visions, have created a ghostly mythology about the statue. Some claim to have heard the weeping, others to have felt the tears of this sculpture, which gazes sadly at the tomb of the Civil War General Samuel M. 
Thomas. They call her the Browns Lady. She might also be called the other legend of Sleepy Hollow. Anthony J. Marmo, a village native, recalled his experiences with the statue in the early 1970s. She was someone you learned about from the older kids, he said. Someone who knew the way would take you there. At one time you could hardly find it, it was hidden by tall rhododendrons. Mr. Marmo recalled these Brown's lady superstitions. If you knocked on the door of the general's tomb and looked through the keyhole, you would have a bad dream that night. Of course, that always worked. There was another one where, if you slapped her in the face, sat in her lap and spit in her eye, she would haunt you for the rest of your life. There was always one brave kid who did it. When we got older, we'd be the ones bringing new kids up. One of us would hide behind the statue and come out screaming if a kid had the nerve to sit in her lap. Terrorize him, you know. Sarah Massia, curator of the Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow Historical Society, said I've heard about her crying. Sign up for the New York Today newsletter each morning, get the latest on New York businesses, arts, sports, dining, style and more. Get it sent to your inbox. People have told me that she weeps because of some tragedy in her life. Of course, you can find scientific explanations for the tears, the sculpture interacting with the environment, and all that. What I used to hear when I was a kid was that if you're nice to the statue, she'll take care of you. Ms. Masia's memories include trips to the site at night with her friend who lived across the road from the cemetery, armed with flashlights or candles. We never really stayed too long on Halloween, she said. If you were really brave you would sit on her lap and be taken care of for life, she said. She and her friend never got up the nerve to do that, she added, but they did touch the lady on a few occasions. The sculpture sits between two stately pines in the north-central section of the fabled graveyard, the burial place of Washington Irving, Andrew Carnegie, Elizabeth Arden, Thomas J. Watson and many members of the Rockefeller family. A shroud covers her wavy bronze locks and a Greco-Roman tunic the rest of her Amazon form. Her forearms are muscled and her hands large and sinewy. There is a forlorn sadness in the slumped shoulders and in the mouth and eyes. Her face is streaked. I just made this to show you that I could do it, he said, but I should never let such a monstrosity out of my studio. Jeannie Delgano, a daughter of a former Sleepy Hollow mayor, remembers her encounters with the legend in the early 1960s. When we were kids, the deal was that you were brave if you went up to the Browns lady and you sat in her lap and slapped her across the face and kicked her in the shins. Then you had to go across to the door of the mausoleum and knock on it three times, and if you did all that, she would come and haunt you. We did it a couple of times but she never came to haunt us. Ms. Arminio, the granddaughter of the little girl of the 1916 ghost story, said her grandmother warned her to be careful when approaching the statue. She said if you went up to the bronze lady and touched her face and said a prayer, within 48 hours something would happen, she said. It would either be very good or very bad. I scoffed at the tale. But two days after I touched the bronze lady's face, a storm brought down a tree limb that crushed my Camaro. A blood-sucking alien predator is ravaging animals throughout the Puerto Rican countryside, or so say this town's mayor and scores of uneasy rural dwellers. Misael Negrin, a 25-year-old college student, is one of 15 Canavanas residents who say they have had a close encounter with the beast, known here as the Chupacabras, or in its literal English translation, Goat Sucker. I was looking off the balcony one night, and I saw it step out of a bright light in the backyard, Negrin said. It was about three or four feet tall with skin like that of a dinosaur. It had bright red eyes the size of hen's eggs long fangs and multicolored spikes down its head and back. True to its name, the creature attacked the family goat, said Negrin, draining the blood from its neck and disemboweling the animal. Tales of bloodthirsty monsters have grasped the collective jugular of this U.S. island commonwealth in the past. But none has left a tangible trail of carnage as extensive as the chupacabras, which by some estimates have already caused 1,000 animal deaths and terrorized the local inhabitants. This is not a joke, said Canavana's Mayor Jose R. Soto. A number of my constituents have lost animals in the past few months. We're taking it very seriously because it's killing animals right now, but people could be next. 
The government gave some credence to the chupacabra's hysteria recently by launching an investigation of the night attacks. At least part of the reason was concern about its impact on the tourist industry. Puerto Rico is just now rebounding from a drop in tourism, and tourist dollars, caused by water problems last year and an oil spill two winters ago that washed a black slick onto the beaches around some of San Juan's nicest hotels. This year, officials, hoteliers and shopkeepers say they are expecting one of the best winters ever, provided rumors of bizarre predators don't scare people off. The mysterious creature earned its tag because many of its earliest victims reportedly were goats. But according to the nearly daily accounts of animal maulings, its diet also includes cattle, chicken, sheep, pigs, dogs and cats, even peacocks. A sportsman and gun collector, Soto Leda, Safari, last month to locate the chupacabras, combing the thickly foliated foothills of the Caribbean National Forest, known as El Yunk. Some 200 townsfolk civil defense workers, and gunpacking police and prison guards formed the search party, using a caged goat as bait. They didn't bag the beast, but Soto claims the safari was a success. Whatever it is knows that we're after it now, he said. And if you look at the pattern where the most recent attacks have taken place, you'll see it hasn't come back here. Jose Espinoza, public information officer for the state's civil defense, said that while many here have mentioned everything from aliens to vampires, he is certain there is a rational, down-to-earth explanation for the recurrent attacks, but he has yet to figure it out. Perhaps it is one of those exotic pets, such as alligators or snakes, that were so popular in the 1960s and 1970s, he said. It is also possible that an animal escaped from one of two wildlife theme parks that used to operate here, including one on the Canavanas border. The Chupacabras has begun to acquire an almost outlaw notoriety. The attacks have inspired three songs, countless spoofs on primetime television and even a new alcoholic beverage, which its inventors said was named after the Chupacabras because nobody knows what's in it. Some here trace the Chupacabras hysteria directly to Puerto Rico's crime tabloid, El Vocero, which they say is using the story to boost sales. The tabloid, which has featured the animal maimings as a major story almost daily, has indeed experienced an increase in circulation, according to El Vocero associate editor German Negroni. But he said the coverage is justified. Initially, Negroni said, he did not take the story very seriously, viewing it as a sort of prank. But now, he said, the reports of animal deaths are real. They are coming so fast and furious now that they are arousing the interest of doctors, scientists, and even politicians. It has raised some very interesting questions. Carlos Soto, a veterinarian who has examined the remains of a Doberman Pinscher and seven rabbits killed by the mystery predator, is convinced that something very strange happened to them. In each case the cause of death were two deep puncture wounds under the right side of the neck, Soto said. The wounds extended into the animals' brains, killing them instantly. The wounds were about the diameter of a drinking straw, and three to four inches in length. They weren't compatible with the bite of a dog, a monkey or any animal I've ever studied. Soto also noted the presence of circular openings in the animal cadavers so perfect a skilled surgeon couldn't have carved them with a scalpel. What is more, none of the slaughtered animals showed signs of rigor mortis. The rabbits were brought in more than 12 hours after death. Soto said, for Madeline Tolentino, 31, of Canavanas, the chupacabras is no mystery. She and her mother stared at the chupacabras for three minutes or so one day when it paused on the sidewalk in front of their home. I told my mother I saw the devil. Well, that was a lot to take in. Go get some sleep and if you can't sleep, subscribe and watch a sleep video of mine. Good night my friends, Explorer X out.